Hail Marys that worked, fourth downs that didn't, and who's a lot better than even we had anticipated. This is the College Game Day podcast for Monday, October 16th. Reese Davis and Pete Thamel with you, fresh off red-eye trips back from Seattle, uh, back to the East Coast from Washington, which was an amazing scene, Pete, in my nine years on College Game Day. That crowd Saturday morning was as good as we've had. It wasn't the cathartic experience that we had at Washington State in 2018, and maybe the crowd wasn't as big as, say, you know, James Madison or some of the other huge crowds that we've had, though it was huge. But the morning, the feel, the vibe, the number of people that we had in the Red Square area was uh, sort of captured the passion that you have all over the country for college football. Yeah, Reese, I obviously don't have nearly as many reps as you on that, but I just thought it was electric. Uh, you had the purple building lit up in the pre-dawn darkness. You had the band on the steps of the library right there. And the the square was compressed in a way that made a giant crowd feel overwhelming. Like there was an urgency to the crowd there. And uh, it was just a blast. Uh, you know, Pat's field goal kicking uh, kicking bit felt bigger uh, when uh, when Grayson hit his second try for 30 grand because it was just like the crowd was like teeming around uh, it. So kudos to Washington because, you know, you show up and you're like, are they going to be there at 6 a.m.? Well, we pulled in at like 4.05. And there were lines further than the than the eyes could see. So uh, chef's kiss to the good football fans of Seattle. And look, there are some Duck fans there, too. You know, I think that added to the spice of the crowd a little bit. A lot of obviously Mm -hmm. Oregon alums living in the Seattle area. Um, Never hurts to have a little bit of a little bit of spice in the crowd to uh, to go with the warmth. So, yeah, just just an unbelievable experience. Uh, One of my most memorable shows. And the and the game delivered as well just uh back and forth uh decisions that will be questioned plays that were made uh and i left there feeling that both teams i I said it in the open on game day and i left the stadium on a great escape by the way by us in the immediate aftermath of um of the missed field goal i left there feeling like that we were seeing two teams that were not only college football playoff worthy but i'm not saying they're the best definitely but could win the national championship both of them and you know that's not to take anything away from georgia michigan you know uh florida state anybody that i might you know have ranked up there in that tier with them oklahoma um but they could win it i i really believe that that you have a couple of you have a couple of teams in that game that aren't going to lose again unless they lose to each other again i don't think and that could end up uh, in the playoff and could win it all. Yeah. Well, when you go through the the contenders, Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, Florida State, Washington, Oregon, Penn State, we'll we'll leave Texas in there too. Um, I mean, none have a better quarterback. Um, Mm -hmm. J.J. McCarthy's really good. I don't think he's as good of a college player as Michael Penix. Um, So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, I think he's, he's his equal right now okay because he can run i mean uh, but yeah but, but i understand what you mean yeah. he's but not like better if, he's not yes, better yeah. yes and, and drake yeah. may is a better prospect but i don't think carolina is a better team and now good mm-hmm. for them let's let's test them some more and, and and see them keep winning but they haven't had a test um you know like washington had this weekend but when you have an offense that can stretch the field you have the best or the second best receiving core in the country and you have Michael Penix, an old dude who can just flat out throw it down the field to guys who can catch it. I just think that that's a recipe. Uh, I just got tell me in the press box, he thinks 10 guys get drafted off this Washington team. Uh, I had written over, you know, seven to nine over the weekend. So that's, that is the double digit talent means you're a playoff team traditionally when you, when you, mm-hmm. when you peek back through, uh, you know, through, through draft days and, and such. So, and look, Oregon, you know, every bit could have won that game in six different ways. And I'm sure we dive into it some and, uh, and they have a ton of really good young talent too. So yeah, like it's, yeah, I think it offends some traditionalist sensibilities that there can be that caliber powerhouses in that part of the country, but they're there and they're not going anywhere. Weekend Review is brought to you by Dr. Pepper. It ain't college football season without the delicious taste of an ice cold Dr. Pepper, the one fans deserve. 
So let's dive into that game a little bit and some of the decisions that were made, particularly by Dan Lanning on fourth down. You and I talked about this pretty extensively at halftime in the press box. I didn't object to Lanning going for it on fourth down on principle late in the half, going two for one. And I think that the prevailing sentiment going into the game, you're not not going to beat Washington kicking field goals. And when you get that close, you better score a touchdown. Philosophically, I didn't disagree with the decision. When I would have taken the points, and I realize hindsight's 20-20, or as the legendary late Pat Dye used to say, hindsight's 50-50. When I would have taken the points is when they dialed up a touchdown play on third down and probably, you know, Bo threw it low, didn't make the completion, and you hadn't you hadn't scored on first and second down, and you kind of missed your chance on third down when you had the right play call. I'm pretty sure there was a Washington defender there, but I think he was going to score had he caught the ball, you know, in stride. I take the points then because I feel like you know what, we just missed a chance right here. We need to. We're getting the ball back to start in the second half, and in that scenario, the, the score was 22 18. So you make the field goal. Let's say you don't st- you don't score and Washington scores next. Worst case scenario, still one possession game. Now it ended up not mattering, or I won't say it didn't matter, but they ended up catching them anyway. But that in fact did happen. Oregon didn't score before Washington did. And now instead of a one possession game, at least for a while, was a two possession game, and Oregon spent some time playing catch up. Philosophically, I didn't mind it. Didn't I like the I like the third down play call, not the fourth, and I probably would have gone ahead and taken the uh, taken the points on uh, fourth down. Of the zero for three, Oregon was on fourth down. I think I had the most conviction over them taking the points there and not not pushing forward, but just because they had the ball back. It was a gifted possession. The receiver slipped on the Penix pick, so mm-hmm. you were just handed this. And they pushed the ball down the field. I just thought it was uh, it, it was a coach being a little bit greedy. I just think, again, situationally, and again, I err on the side of aggression in mm-hmm. in most of these in most of these decisions. I think right there, hey, let's take this free gift. Let's get the ball back. Let's have them feeling like they're on their heels all halftime and feeling like they need to come out, you know, with with a little bit more firepower and then try to try to double up and sort of control this first part of the third quarter. So that was the one I thought you can you can debate the other ones. I didn't think there was much of a debate on that one. Mm -hmm. What did you think about what did you think about the one at the end, the fourth down? before Washington scored the go-ahead touchdown, where I I thought from all of the years of watching Bo Nix at Auburn, the number of times that he pooch punted, I thought yeah. for sh- I thought for sure that's what they were going to do. But I also want to be consistent in this regard, Pete. Um when when we had the Colorado, Colorado State game a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. and I said we got a chance to win the game win the game right then it was a little bit farther uh it was a fourth and three from the Mm -hmm. washington 47 so fourth and three with two minutes to go but you have a chance if you convert um to get that probably put the game away right there um but i i really thought as it turns out that might have worked out for them because they at least had time to get back into field goal range because it only took washington two plays to score but i thought there that they were probably going to try the pooch punt and see if they could at least make them go 90 instead of making them go 53 yeah so that call i'm like 50 50 on i kind of get yeah. why they did it that fits I do to win the game yeah. thing I didn't like the play call on either third or fourth down, though. I didn't feel like they gave themselves a great chance to uh, to convert, to do what the, their intentions were there. So any any second guessing there, I think, goes on the specific what they called in trying to, you know, push forward as opposed to uh, as opposed to the actual like the, the theoretic decision making on it. Mm hmm. So as a, as it turns out, the fourth downs ended up. Ended up getting them, but did you leave the did you leave the stadium thinking? I know that we both think that they're that they're top flight playoff teams. Did you walk out of there or sprint out of there, as the case may be, 
Did you think that the better team won? The team that has the better chance to win the national championship won? Boy, that's a good question. Um, the one thing about Oregon seeing them live that would scare me against a better defense is that I feel like they threw the ball down the field once in the game. Like, I feel like everything they did was so horizontal and effectively horizontal, right? But it was so horizontal all game. And I think Washington has a good defense, but they, they do not have an elite defense by any means. I feel like an elite defense could maybe suffocate Oregon a little bit more than an elite defense could suffocate Washington because they have the the, the, the playmakers down the field. I, I think Oregon has one high-end receiver, but I don't think they have a high-end receiving core. Um, they have one elite tight end. They have a few good offensive linemen. Um, and Bo Nix is, is very, is, you know, efficiency through the nines. I don't know about how dynamic he can be in a downfield passing game, which I think you, you need that card in your deck at some point. I Oregon outgained them by oh, yeah. over a hundred yards and Oregon just by offensive philosophy is going to run the ball better. And they did. And I, I questioned a few times whether they, whether they should have run it even more against them. And yet because of the way the game is played and the equalizer that you're talking about, and I do believe both teams can win it all, but I think the better team won the game. It doesn't always happen. I don't know that I don't know that Washington necessarily played better or just made more plays. And I know that in some in some people's estimation, that might be a distinction without a difference. But they made the big plays when they need. They made downfield plays, which is part of their DNA. It's how they win games. And I think if there are shortcomings when they faced a Georgia or a Michigan uh anywhere. That is the great equalizer. And that's the way the game is played these days. And they have enough on defense. I think they're not USC by any stretch of the imagination sure. on defense. They're not the some of the old school Oklahoma teams. And there's a common denominator there that maybe we'll get into in just a moment. But I, I, I feel like the, the slightly, the by a hair better team won the game. Saturday and I I think that um could Oregon get them again in the Pac-12 championship game which I fully expect to see sure they could but it's not going to be surprise not going to be surprising to me if Washington goes into the playoff undefeated so I mean they're 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 a handful they've got the veteran leader Penix sensational uh, I mean and they got McMillan back and then they lost him you know the guy mm -hmm. that they thought could really help them against Oregon and they hope you know certainly hope that they get him back at some point you know I one of the other things I think that was that was neat at halftime, several of Kalen DeBoer's former players from Sioux Falls came up to me and introduced themselves. And we started talking about Kalen's background. And I asked, you know, what he was like back then and what he's like now. And they all to uh, they all, of course, loved playing for him. Very appreciative for everything he's done. He set them up in the, the DeBoer family suite to watch the game on Saturday. And he spent some time with them on Friday, which you wouldn't necessarily always get from high-level head coaches. So they were greatly appreciative of that. But they also were sort of chuckling, as former players do, you know, about coaches and sort of the laid-back uh, nature that he has in some regards. And they're like, who are you and what did you do with Coach DeBoer, who was at Sioux Falls? You know, because they were talking about – and the reason I tell this story is because a couple of, a couple of guys played receiver. And they said that he would yell, you know, just scream right before a snap in, in practice at Sioux Falls and call their names and say, you know, and want them to move like inches, inches in their alignment because he was, he's so precise in how he creates the space that if they're not lined up, you know, exactly precisely, almost to the inch, he said, you know, we would look at it and say, how could this make any difference? And then he'll roll the tape back and say, this is the teaching point. This is why you have to be there because of the way it makes the secondary react and line up and it creates these spaces. And I thought it gave some insight into why he's successful. First, he's built loyalty from former players and the proverbial, you know, is uh, in touch with where he came from, or at least, you know, hasn't 
uh, as we might have said growing up in the South. He's not too big for his britches, you know, now that now that he's become a big deal. And yet there's still uh, behind that affable nature, there's a a technician who demands precision and excellence. And I think you see that evidenced in the in the Washington, the entire Washington team, but particularly in that uh, in that passing attack that is run now by Ryan Grubb, their offensive coordinator, who has been right there with those guys who I was talking to from Sioux Falls and has been with uh, DeBoer from quite some time. It was an interesting uh, spot for DeBoer this week, Reese, because I really feel like this is the first time the spotlight of the entire country has been on Washington since he's been there. And uh, yeah, I got in pretty early Thursday and went to practice. I found DeBoer to be incredibly loose, like mm-hmm. uh, almost like shockingly loose. Again, you and I have been around on all these campuses, the weekends of big games, and you get varying levels of uh, openness, affability, uh, access from these coaches. And DeBoer was just crazy loose. Uh, he told a great story uh, on Thursday to me when he took the head job at Sioux Falls, they were going, and I'm going to fudge these numbers a little bit off memory, but they were going to pay him $52,000 a year. And they were going to pay Chuck Morrell, who still is defensive coordinator, 40,000. And he, in his negotiation, wanted to get Morrell up. Uh, Maybe it was 35 or 38 and he wanted to get him to 42. So he ended up taking the job for 45,000 as the head coach and Morrell as the assistant coach made 42. And he said to him, it was the biggest no brainer of all time because he knew what they could do together and how they, how well they would work together. Uh, There's a few more zeros on the end of those uh, numbers now, but (laughs) I thought that was good insight into like, all right, this guy's thinking really, really big picture here. He's not so locked in the, in the granular, in the incremental. Um, I think if you, he, he debuted Reese at Fresno in, in COVID year, went three and three from that point on, he's 26 and five as a head coach, nine and three at Fresno, 11 and two beat Texas in the Alamo bowl last year at Washington, obviously now six and zero oh in the top five of the country this year. So, I mean, you want to talk about a coach who's coming on a rocket ship. That's, mm-hmm. that's Kalen DeBoer right now. And uh, I- impressive to see, uh, I had a, I had a scout tell me this week and I wrote this on uh, ESPN.com going into the game that, he just left there thinking like the vibe of that program. And these scouts go in and out of every program. They see everything. He thought it was a vibe of fun, love. He just like came away super impressed. A lot of these recruits, the older kids especially, were Chris Peterson recruits. So they're high character, OKGs, Coach Pete used to call mm-hmm. them, my kind of guys. Mm-hmm. And I think the philosophical and human transition from Peterson to now the the baton through through DeBoer, obviously there was Jimmy Lake in the middle and a hiccup there. Um, there's a lot of alignment between those uh between those two guys and it'll be a lot of fun to see if they can keep it going um will they get a quarterback from the portal next year they're obviously going to have to replace the receiver it's it's you know it is not manifest destiny that they're going to be in this Mm -hmm. position at every point like a lot of things uh a lot of things have lined uh have lined up and i'll just leave with this thought because it wouldn't be a pod if we didn't mention puka nakua think about their receiving room in 2020 when you have Puka Nakua, who's now, you know, one of the leaders for NFL Rookie of the Year uh, with, with the Rams, the receiver end up transferring to BYU. You have obviously uh, McMillan came in in that class. So Nakua was 19 and uh, M- McMillan came in in 20 and Roma Dunze came in in 20. Like that's a pretty good NFL starting receiver lineup, <laughs> right? You know, right now. And then Polk, uh, Polk came in, I think, on transfer from Texas Tech the year, the year after that. So um, if I was a receiver, I'd want to play in that offense. No question about it. And I would be remiss to say if I wasn't also impressed with how Dan Lanning brought his team into as difficult an environment mm-hmm. against a great team as I've seen. And they never flinched. I mean, that's sort of his, as we've gotten to know him more as a head coach uh, from the camera in the locker room prior to Colorado to his appearance on on game day. He's he too, he too is a friendly guy, but he's steadfast. He's intense. And the most important thing in my judgment that a coach can do is build the program in his image. Now, that doesn't mean surround himself with a bunch of yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir kind of guys. But it does mean that it needs to reflect what he believes in. And Lanning clearly believes in aggression. 
He believes in toughness. He he believes in the line of scrimmage. And, you know, they they came up just a little bit short. And maybe if the field goal goes in, they wouldn't have. But, you know, he too. Th- those are two superstar head coaches in the Pac-12 right now that are headed for the Big Ten that will be able to, I know they're not going to do divisions, but at least geographically will um, – will bring some power to the West. And certainly I know USC is going to do that as well, which seems a natural transition point while two Pac-12 teams headed to the Big Ten acquitted themselves beautifully. And they have me saying on a podcast the following Monday that both of them could still win the national championship, a team that I thought would go to the playoff in the preseason. I now have significant doubts about not just because of the meltdown in South Bend by USC, but because of the two previous weeks as well, uh, not being able to finish teams. They were very, very lucky to beat Arizona. They probably shouldn't have, um, or at least they should have won by one. When I'll, Someday I'll get over Jed Fish not trying to win the game right there at that point and putting Caleb Williams back on the field. But Al Golden's Notre Dame defense vexed Caleb, forced him into three interceptions. The defense was not able to play complementary football and, and keep them in the game, although they were put in, in really, really tough circumstances. Special teams let them down. And, and pretty much it was just a the quintessential meltdown on the road from USC against Notre Dame on Saturday night. It, it was, and the defense actually played pretty well. Like that might have been USC's best defensive performance of the year. I think they only gave up 275 yards. So, well, they didn't have far to go a lot of times. Correct. Too, yes. Though. Yeah. The three picks will uh, three picks will do that. Uh, will, will will do that to you. I want to peek ahead here, Reese, and uh, this is a modest hijacking. Um, maybe like a maybe like an Uber lifting of the of the car of the podcast. Not a not a full hijack. But uh, I want to quiz you. USC hosts Utah October twenty first. Win or loss for the Trojans. When I know, I know why that sounds you. I know they played badly the other night coming off a loss and I don't care. Even when you play badly, you better be able to score and SC. I know SC's defense might've played its best game against Notre Dame. I know they're not there. They beat them twice last year, beat them up physically once. I'm going to say Trojan win there. Utes have won three in a row in that series, obviously, including yep. uh, including both last year. So at Cal, we don't have to burn a lot of time on that. Trojans right. can find a way win. to win that. Home, Washington, November 4th. Loss. Loss. At Oregon, November 11th. Loss. Uh, home, UCLA, November 18th. Win. Okay. I would go loss Utah, win at Cal, loss Washington, loss at Oregon, coin flip UCLA because who knows what you're looking like at that point right mm-hmm. like just who knows where where this thing where this thing ends up so I would call this what we're about to see in the next six weeks the first real adversity that Lincoln Riley could be facing in his head coaching career because it has been it has been a pretty linear rocket ship to coaching stardom for Lincoln Riley and there are clearly some fundamental foundational things that are going to come into the crosshairs here in the next few weeks. So I'm just really curious how he responds from, from the big picture. Cause it feels like there's some type of reboot, especially with Caleb Williams going out the door. He's bailed them out a few times, uh, you know, the last, the last year and a half. I, I'm just really curious from 30,000 feet, how USC endures the next six, seven weeks. And if Lincoln Riley stays pretty stubborn to trying to win the way he's tried to win. You, you know me, and I really try to be a man of reason and mm-hmm. even-tempered judgment. And when we were walking toward our flights in the Seattle airport, I said to you the other night that I worried about this being an overreaction. But at what point do we say, can you win it all with the, with the approach that Lincoln Riley has taken in his career? I know how close they came in that Georgia Rose Bowl game with Baker. Maybe they beat Alabama in the next game. Maybe they don't. Um, But I know they came close there. But you've had unbelievable quarterbacks every time. And the same problems rear their heads. They can't 
get enough stops on defense or in the case of that Georgia game, even though they had the big lead, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't stop them effectively enough, couldn't stop the run effectively enough, which was hard to do with that Georgia team for sure. Couldn't finish the deal. They haven't been able to do it. USC, the big, strong physical teams, Utah, you mentioned the way they've, they've handled them the last three meetings. I mean, they won a wild one in Salt Lake city last year, but I feel like we're getting to that point. I don't want to be unfair because he clearly is a tremendous coach. He's oh, a sure. brilliant offensive mind. You don't win as much as he's won just by saying, Hey, I, you know, I've, I've had Baker and Kyler and Jalen hurts and Caleb Williams, Spencer Rattler in the middle, you know, you know, you don't just get lucky with those guys and still win because you see a lot of programs that have really good players that don't win at this level. Does there need to be some type of substantive change in his approach to team building if they are going to win national championships without maybe the catch of lightning in the bottle year and you and you throw for 500 against some team that gets dizzy in the secondary and you go on to win it, which certainly could happen with the offensive guru that he is. But can you be that team? Can you be that team that is there every year? The team like Georgia is now. Like you know, I know Alabama's a, a step back, but what Alabama has been, really what Ohio State has been, what Clemson has been until the last couple of years, that you're not there on the periphery because of uh, maybe you played a weaker schedule, maybe you've outmanned everybody in your conference. You're there. You're a dude every year. Can you do that? without some type of substantive tweak in his philosophy or am I be, or am I jumping the gun? Is that, is it too early to ask that question uh, given his tenure at USC? I think, th I think it's fair Reese. I mean, look, he's never lost more than three games now in his, in his seventh mm -hmm. year as a head coach. Yeah. Um, I'd be surprised if he doesn't lose three this year. I think, I think you and I are aligned with that. Like it, it, it I think he, is expected to lose three and, and perhaps more. And I think where it gets interesting when you talk big picture, do we lean more on defense? Do we make some changes? Is when you look at the 2024 schedule, LSU and Vegas to open the year. I have no idea, but I would imagine there's a pretty good chance. We'll, oh, it's a Sunday game. So we probably won't be there for college game day, but that'll be, that'll be, boy, that'll be a big game. Um, you know, that'll be a top five game in the sport next year. Uh, those two brands meeting in, uh, in Vegas. So you have USC, LSU, um, and then I'm not going to go through it all, but I would say they play Notre Dame at home. They play at Michigan. They play at UCLA. They play Penn state at home and they play at Washington. Um, and you can throw in an at Minnesota and a home Nebraska in there and, and, and whatnot. And I bring this up to say, if it's not working now, when you're playing Arizona state, Arizona and Colorado, is it going to work when all of a sudden your reality includes the Wolverines and the Nittany Lions and eventually the Buckeyes and such? Because that's a little bit of a different class of schedule as you as you shift over. Lincoln was was very clear with Heather Dennich this year at Pac-12 Media Day. He wants to keep playing Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, th and that program has seemingly an up arrow trajectory wise going, um, and they just they just throttled the Irish just throttled the Trojans. So. I just think do is a recalibration needed because the schedule almost demands it because the competition demands it. And it, it's hard when you've been so good at something and so close to breaking through at the highest, 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 highest level. Right. Um, Cause he made the playoff multiple times, but never made oh, the yeah. title game. Um, do, how, like I can understand the inherent hesitancy Reese to not want to change a lot because boy, that's a lot of success. So I think it's a really fascinating high level discussion um, that that's going to have to happen internally there. I don't think it's as simple as changing defensive coordinators either. I don't, I don't know if it's tweaking the way you practice, if it's, uh, if it's tweaking a mindset, you know, somehow uh, pushing the right button philosophically. But the one thing I do wonder Pete and now, I'm not talking about Ohio State and Michigan because they're not going to adjust to anybody. They're going to make people adjust to them or they're going to do it their way no matter what. But the rest of the Big Ten, it could be. We saw this in the SEC. Um, the SEC, for a long stretch of time, became a real offensive conference 
was some questions about the defense, as weird as that would sound in terms of putting stops to people. It wasn't quite vintage Big 12 when you know Lincoln was running through everybody. But I say this because it could be that Lincoln is so good offensively that instead of them having to adjust to some of those games other than Ohio State and Michigan that you that you mentioned, maybe everybody has to adjust to them because of because of the way they play and the number of points they're going to put up. Because look, Iowa's got a great defense. I mean, even USC's uh, you know below average, potentially improving, at least good at creating some negative plays uh, defense. You know, they'll stop Iowa enough that Iowa has no chance to beat them. None, you know, and, you know, the, the same would be said for for Minnesota, you know, which here's here's a really interesting stat. And this is only a moderate hijack because I want to go back to USC. But Minnesota plays Iowa for Floyd of Rosedale this weekend. Mm-hmm. You love your trophies, Reese Davis. God yeah, bless I you. do. I do <laughs> love the trophies. Floyd of Rosedale is a great trophy. It's the one rivalry trophy Fleck hasn't won at Minnesota, by the way. Yes. They are the two worst passing offenses in the Power Five. Only Navy and Air Force throw for fewer yards per game than Minnesota and Iowa. Yeah, I said Navy and Air Force, which by omission tells you Army throws for more yards per game. Monk's letting it rip could. this year. He's evolving. Yeah. So, uh, which and somebody needs to hire that guy. But I digress. But I'm saying that I think you might see a lot more adjusting to the Lincoln Riley, Kalen DeBoer uh, philosophy than you will the other way around among teams not named Michigan, Ohio State, and probably Penn State. There were a number of headline games over the weekend. One of them certainly was not Georgia at Vanderbilt. It was, you know, Georgia sort of slopped around. Vanderbilt got a big interception that gave him a chance to get within a one-possession game late. It was sort of the quintessential early start. Georgia messes around, plays with its food, which seems to be the new uh, metaphor that people like to use in discussing uh, teams that don't take care of business. Teddy Thamel would like that because he yeah. plays with his food now. <laughs> but one big, one big thing did come out of it. And it was a Brock Bowers injury. And as we're recording this podcast, you just found out uh, what's going on with Brock and what it means for the dogs. Yeah. Georgia announced he's going to be out four to six weeks. He's having that tightrope surgery, which is the high ankle sprain surgery du jour. Tua had it kind of famously uh, a couple years ago. And um, it's, it's pretty interesting Reese because Georgia's offense is, is good, but not great. I think that's fair to say, right? Like it's, it's yeah, it's, it's not a, juggernaut but it works for them and i think taking away carson beck's biggest target all of a sudden makes a few of these games when you when you go there uh so i believe they have a uh yeah they're they have off this week five. and then they have florida next yeah. week yeah yeah so i'm not sitting here proclaiming this is going to be the end of georgia it's going to lose but you you can't tell me that uh cocktail party missouri at home Ole Miss, and then at Tennessee, which is then the 18th of November, right in the middle of that range. You can't tell me those games aren't going to be a little more snug um, and a little more dicey without uh, without that. Just considering how if they don't have Brock Bauer, it was at Auburn, they lose that game. I think that's a I think that's a pretty safe thing to say. So I think in a year where in my 20 years doing this, the top has never been more compacted, right? And you can argue Georgia or Michigan, number one team in the country – taking Brock Bowers off of Georgia for this semi-extended period of time only just c- continues to crunch together a, uh, a a loaded one to eight, basically. It, I, I agree with you. The one thing I will say is that when they come out on the other side and he returns, hopefully to full health, mm-hmm. if they are able to navigate this path, which I pretty much expect them to do just to be candid about it, they might have developed other weapons because now while it has been great for Carson Beck to have Brock Bowers as a security blanket with him not being there, uh, he will have to find someone else. And then maybe when they're playing in the SEC championship game against LSU or against Alabama, maybe against Ole Miss again, uh, depending on how everything falls, they might have a couple. And it's, uh, I'm not, I, it's it's not a good thing for sure because that that dude is a stud and mm-hmm. the centerpiece of their offense. But I'm not panicked about what they have coming up. The one thing is you read off their schedule that is really interesting that how perceptions change once you get to midseason. That 
the initial thought was that they didn't even have a chance to lose a game, barring playing their D minus game until they went to Tennessee. Now, uh, in the preseason, I said, you know, if they if they play a B, B, B minus game and Ole Miss plays an A plus game with their offensive weapons, maybe you'll miss. Well, now you're looking at it. Missouri's only lost once and certainly could have won the game against LSU. Um, Ole Miss has only lost once on the road against Alabama. And Tennessee, depending on what it does this weekend, might come into that game with only one loss. And while Georgia's schedule is certainly you know, not going to be confused with one of the elite of all time, it suddenly doesn't look quite as soft. The non-conference, because of having to cancel the Oklahoma game, I'm not talking about that. But I mean, just their schedule strength overall looks a little dicier than it did uh, than it did when we were evaluating it in July and August. Well, we have Bill Connolly popping in here right now. Bill, we have the news that just broke. George is going to be without Brock Bowers four to six weeks, tight rope surgery on the ankle he injured against Vanderbilt. Um, how does that change? I guess, how reliant do you see Georgia's offense being on Brock Bowers, and how does this change um, their reality? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with pretty much what's been said here. I mean, this is a team that throws quite a bit um, more than the national average, even though they're usually mm -hmm. winning. Um, but, you know, they're, they're fifth overall in pass and success rate, um, seventh in pass completion rate. There are certainly a lot of, uh, he's spreading the ball around to a lot of weapons right now. Bowers obviously has the most catches and, and uh, he's the most unique weapon in the country really, but he's still got, uh, you know, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven other guys with double digit catches, um, and, and, you know, we'll see Oscar Delpa tight end obviously has, has a pedigree himself and, and everybody else, but, um, yeah, it, it certainly puts a little, you know, it's a security blanket. He's a very, he's a six, five, whatever security blanket. And, and Beck is now without him for a little bit. Uh, like Reese said, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to be worried about Georgia. I can't be worried about Georgia. Um, even though they have a lot of teams, you know, their next four opponents in my SP plus rankings are 31st, 26th, 20th, and 12th in order. Actually, they get a little better each time. Hmm. Um, this is still uh, the one time they had to show up from the start this year, they did. And I would assume that that's going to be a habit here over the next few games. Missouri, um, and we always like to look back, but I do want to touch on this since you're with us right now and you are a, a proud Missouri guy. Among First of all, Reese, if we're going to bring up Missouri, we have to bring up Bill State. The stake. The yeah, stake. Yeah, that's right. Bill, 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 Bill won the ribeye. In the race for the ribeye. And well, he consumed he it chance. this week. Spotted Owl, Bill? Is that oh. what I mean? <laughs> Still Bard Owl. Still Bard Owl. Bard Owl. Sorry, Bard, <laughs> Bard Owl. Owl. Spotted Owls probably Spotted extinct, Owls are so. perhaps endangered species or extinct. I'm not sure which. <laughs> yeah, and, and they also make a very good steak. Um, Spotted that's... Owls do? Spotted Owls make Bard good steaks? <laughs> Spotted Owls do. Oh. We don't want PETA, PETA to bust up <laughs> our podcast right. here. <laughs> no, went ahead and we, we finally took the plunge here. Uh, you know, the season just goes by in a heartbeat if you actually try to break me out of my habits. But we actually went and got ourselves the uh, the lovely uh, wag you whatever hundred something aged wagyu um on on like thursday of last week and it was it was it was a lovely piece of meat and all the uh, all the sides that you go to bard al for were, were lovely as well so it was a it was a wonderful all-around meal awesome. so you you've had the meal and also <laughs> uh also bringing uh bringing the big steak is missouri right now if if there were a team that epitomizes a mid-season team that is significantly better than i thought it was going to be it's missouri and you might have written this someone wrote that in the old days old missouri <laughs> after falling behind or recent vintage missouri most missouri just to be honest gets off to a start the way it did against kentucky the other night and that game's gone you know just not and instead they they put the hammer down <laughs> after that do you agree that is Missouri better than you anticipated or did you think they would be what they it's, are? It, it was one of those big wins that you didn't want to happen the way it happened where, you know, I'm sure Eli Drinkwitz preferred not to fall behind 14, nothing after a pretty bad fourth quarter. And I'm sure he would have preferred Luther Burton, the third to have another 140 something yard receiving game and not two catches for 15 yards. But when you're forced to go to plan B, C, D, E, whatever, 
and you look that good doing it. You know, they, they turned the game on that fake punt. They got a, a, a touchdown, a uh, really nice play from Marquise Johnson there to uh, get them on the board. They, they, it was 38 to seven from that point forward. And so, yeah, you'd prefer for everything to be really easy and to, to be winning from the start. But when you have to face that kind of situation and you respond to it that well, that ends up being the best possible win for your program. So th- he certainly learned a lot. I mean, you're looking at a, at a situation now where I think my, my ratings have uh, Missouri, like the border, the kind of the, 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 the over under now is about nine games. Uh, they have a 52% chance of being nine and three or better 48% chance of going eight and four or worse. Uh, that's certainly a couple wins higher than where that bar was set at the beginning of the year. So it's been a nice, you hate with, you know, my, my buddy after the game uh, immediately texted like, man, why that LSU game, why couldn't we have, like why? How could we not have figured out a way through that one? Because we'd be seven and zero. But you know, so be it. You're six and one. You look really good. Obviously, the losing to LSU didn't affect the whatever your status is in the East Division race because it comes down to whether you beat Georgia or not. Either way, so um, things are things are certainly looking pretty good. Couple of things. First, LSU is the USC of the SEC. <laughs> with, okay. With with probably with probably better bones that m- might get it figured out defensively. And a worse defense. Yeah. 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 That's, that's what I mean. They're, <laughs> they've got this, they've got this spectacular magical quarterback and, you know, I know they made the last pick six to finish off Missouri, but, um, and, and cover too. So that was important in some quarters, but um, it was, uh, I think that, you know, that's an understandable loss. You get into a shootout. Sometimes you're going to lose. What would the numbers look like? I don't mean percentage chance to win. But how would the game have to unfold for Missouri, which which caught sleepwalking Georgia in Columbia last year and took them right down to the end? But now Georgia, uh, we would assume, would be ready. Right. What would the numbers have to look like, some of your analytical numbers look like, for a Missouri upset or a chance to win or lose on the last couple of plays? Yeah, it feels like the fact that Missouri is doing well pretty much clinches that they won't beat Georgia because Georgia will show up. Um, but that aside, I mean, this is a, a really weird Georgia team right now. They're good against the run, but they're not great against the run. Um, their pass defense is awesome, like very, very good. Uh, Tyke Smith, I'm, you could almost say he's the MVP of the team right now other than Bowers himself. Uh, but they still don't rush the passer very well. They give you time to to move around a little bit. Uh, and, and so you can kind of carve out a situation where maybe Missouri avoids negative plays. They stay on schedule. Cody Schrader is good at getting you two, three yards, at least. Um, even if he's not exactly a, a, a you know, four, two forty kind of runner, once he gets into the open field, he's a very strong runner. And it, if they can stay on schedule and pick their spots and move Luther burden around a little bit, you can see them scoring into the, at least into the twenties. Again, they got 22 last year and they're a better offense this year. Um, and so then it just becomes, you know, can they throw Carson Beck off, uh, you know, can they get it really aggressive and, and be rewarded for it? Like they did last year on defense. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> obviously if Bowers isn't there, that helps, but, uh, you could certainly see a situation where Missouri's yeah, just kind of sticking around, getting into the twenties, um, you know, getting off the field, forcing field goals, not giving up 60 yard touchdowns or anything, um, and winning a 20 something to 20 something kind of game. I'm not. That's not a prediction George is going to win, but uh, you could see that one kind of playing out that way. Who do you think could match up with them best, Bill, when you go Florida, Missouri, Ole Miss, uh, Tennessee, and Knoxville? Um, what, what's what's funny is Tennessee isn't Tennessee this year. The, yes. They're winning games with a run game and defense, and that, I think, matches up better against Georgia hmm. than a team that's just relying on, on huge uh, pass plates because, again, Georgia's pass defense is phenomenal. Um, so you could almost kind of see them playing like a better Auburn, like a, that kind of style, making some early stops, uh, controlling the game on the ground, like Auburn did for a little while. Um, so I, I honestly, obviously Ole Miss is always a spectacular wild card. That's just kind of their role in the SEC as a whole. And they're really good at that role. Uh, so obviously if they just find some, if, if Lane Kiffin finds some ridiculous play calling rhythm and they get a bunch of 50 yard passes or whatever, then that's a completely different story. But I think I trust the game being in Knoxville helps even more, I guess, but I think I might actually trust Tennessee uh, with the style they're playing to beat Georgia more than I did uh, more than I might have at the beginning of the season. One other game from this past weekend that might have signaled the arrival of a legitimate playoff contender was North Carolina and Miami. I, when I was reviewing college game day, I, I think that oddly I, 
I didn't, I wouldn't say it threw shade at Drake May, but I, I sort of made reference to what I was trying to get across was the stats haven't been like otherworldly in Correct. terms of touchdown passes and no interceptions, stuff like that. He's been great. He's made plays. He's thrown touchdown passes with his left hand. You know, he does, he does some crazy good stuff. And now he's doing even more crazy good stuff because there are a lot of other people doing that too for North Carolina. Um, that was the game that North Carolina for basically its entire football existence has lost and turned the attention on that <laughs> campus to how good they're going to be in basketball. I know it's always kind of there, but that's the game they always lose. They had moments where Miami, desperate, embarrassed, who brought it, which I give credit to Miami for that. Yep. And they not only took the punch, they delivered a harder one. They can run it. Chizik has him flying around, creating enough disruption, it seems, or at least enough cl clutch plays that they're not what they were last year. And they've got this dude at quarterback. <laughs> I think they're I think they're legit. Now, I I it's probably history conditioned in me, Bill and Pete, that <laughs> I am still wary of a stumble for them. But they're good. I, I yeah. think I think they're Pete was talking about condensing the field and the number of contenders. I kind of think North Carolina is creeping right around the edge of that. Of of I mean, their record has them right in the middle of it, but I'm talking right. about just evaluation of watching them as a team has them creeping around of being a playoff team. Yeah. And um yeah, that, I mean, you said it right. Like that was, I think I tweeted out like halfway through the second quarter of that game. Like, well, I mean, who knows what happens now, but Miami showed up uh, mm -hmm. and, and we weren't sure if they were going to, they did, they were playing like, you know, they were wounded and wanted a big win here. And and like you said, from that point forward, uh, it, it was uh, for about the next two quarters, at least it was an absolute blowout. So uh, they, no, they're, they're really, really solid. The defense is still like, you know, top 40 ish, not like a uh, top 10 by any means, but that's still a major improvement over the last couple of years and they don't have to make that many stops it's what i was saying about like a usc in in august you only need like a top 40 defense or so if you have a top five offense um they're borderline top five and they're borderline top 40 so it's working really well i do having duke and clemson back to back in november is going to be huge they should get there undefeated obviously georgia tech's been kind of a wild card this year too but virginia georgia tech campbell over the next three games they should absolutely get to get to nine and oh, um, but Duke's really, really solid. Clemson's obviously very solid still. So we'll see if they're that good, but they should get to nine and oh, for sure. Where do we break off the playoff contender line here? All right. So, so I think through the, through Texas at eight is kind of a no brainer, right? I think you have to include Oregon at nine. We'll include Carolina at 10, Alabama at 11. Absolutely. I'm not throwing them out. Oregon state at 12. Ole Miss at 13, opportunity looms. Utah at 14. Is that is Utah at 14 where we, where we cut it off? I mean, that's a lot of teams, guys. You know, teams. for there's some years where we're already like matching up who's going to be one and three and two and four. Right. Or one and four and two and three. Sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, like that. You, you, the bracket math kind of threw me out there. It's it's yeah. Um, yeah. I'm no, not the like, numbers guy, Bill. Thankfully, we're all <laughs> we're all grateful for that. So we um I, I kind of I, I'm seeing it as eleven an eleven team race right now. Okay. I think I don't I don't trust Ole Miss uh, again. I I love the role that they play in this, but uh, I don't think they win all the games they need to win. But um, I do think. You know, I do this thing where um, last November I decided, you know, if we're all mad at the committee, I, I'm going to come up, I'm going to play like around with like a BCS type formula to see if, uh, you know, if we can like see what it says about what, how the playoff ranking should look, um, spit out a formula that basically predicted exactly what the play, what the committee would come up with in, a, in, in, from week to week. So I started, I've been watching it these last few weeks just to see how it's taken shape. Um, and I do think that's kind of where the dividing line is. You've got Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, Florida State, Washington, Oklahoma, just like the polls, Penn State up there as well. Um, I do think P Texas and Alabama and Oregon are right there with one loss. Uh, they're probably still ahead of North Carolina if, if like the playoff rankings came out today. Uh, but no, I think uh, with the paths that each of these teams have, all of those teams are are, are still semi-realistic at least they have a, a very clear path forward and i don't know i could be talked into old miss and oregon state uh utah i would need to see cam rising being 100 percent before i believe that one i think uh or just see him at all even but uh yeah i think I, i'm looking at 11 right now i'm comfortable saying 11 
No, I'm I'm looking at it, Bill, based on the AP rankings, and I yep. would say if you go sub tiers, I I don't think there's any separation. Like we talked at some point last week, what's the gap between Georgia and everybody else yep. at number yep. one? And I say the gap is nothing. There is no gap uh, because I I think Georgia, Michigan, Florida State, and Washington are to my eyes an evaluation the best teams like just a tick below that uh either based on accomplishment or maybe in oregon texas case a stumble just a slightest of ticks and maybe on the same tier would be oklahoma texas oregon penn state ohio state i would put because i don't have ohio state in that top tier right now and i don't have penn state in there yet that might change after saturday I, but also contending, I would say North Carolina, and I would almost then say that there the line is like ten and a half because I'm I'm not sure where Alabama falls in that. If they fall, <laughs> if they fall in the category of they're up there with those ten or so, or are they in that group where by record and and ability they can earn their way there? That would be you know Alabama, Oregon State. Uh, you know, even I would say everybody in the AP top 20 that has one loss with the exception of Notre Dame, Notre Dame is in the top 20. They probably don't have a path to the playoff. Even LSU, this doesn't feel like we're going to get all of these uh, chaotic results, but if LSU were to win out and win the SEC, <laughs> even with a two loss, they might. But I, I think that is a scenario under which an SEC champion could be left out um, depending on what else happens. But um, it's, it's interesting because I I think it's about it's it's either ten or eleven of the you know of the top two tiers to me depending on where Alabama falls on that line week to week. Yeah, I think um, the most exciting part of when I, when I did the SP Plus rankings, the updates on Sunday morning was looking at the list and seeing that there's only six and a half points difference between number one and number eleven. Um, so like basically if Michigan and Florida state, who's number 11, are, my numbers still aren't completely sold on FSE for whatever reason, if they were to play on a neutral field, Michigan would be favored by a six and a half points and anybody in between Ohio state, Georgia, Washington, Texas, Oregon, Oklahoma, Penn state, Alabama, or Notre Dame would all be even less than that against the best, the quote unquote best team in the country. So that's, this is a different kind of like we always think of parody like, you know, 2007 where everybody's losing games. Uh, but in this case, it's like a bunch of teams looking like top 10 teams. And, um, you know, it, it'll be really obviously now we have some elimination games. We just had sort of mm -hmm. one with Oregon, Washington. We'll have Ohio State, Penn State. So things will start to look a lot clearer, probably uh, in terms of the top. But right now, yeah, you could you could make a case for about eight different teams being in the top four. And, um, you know, that's that's good. That's healthy at this point in the season, I think. Bill, I'm going to do another hijacking. It's my second hijack of the pod today. But we're <laughs> we're, we're, we're running towards uh, we're like on Red Square at Washington. We're compressed here. I want to know your quick hit thoughts, which we would have asked you on Wednesday if you came in your normal rotation spot on Ohio State, Penn State. Do you have any conviction there or your numbers convicted in any way? What What's your what's your early knee jerk? It's, it's going to be a really fun game to just kind of write out the preview for because you've got to, like the, the Ohio State passing game versus Penn State's pass defense is it is incredible. Like Penn State's number one in most of the passing categories this year, pass defense categories. Um, and so what does that mean? I mean, is, is, you know, Ohio State going to raise its game like Georgia did against Kentucky and they'll, they'll, you know, score 30 plus because that's what they do against everybody, including Penn State, or, you know, they only scored 17 against Notre Dame and, and Penn State's defense is quite possibly, probably better than Notre Dame's. So it's going to be a real test of exactly what Ohio State's ceiling is. And then there's the whole thing where Penn State doesn't ever make a play more than 10 yards. And, and it's going to, it's really hard to, beat a top five team on the road if you're going four yards at a time downfield so like what have they been holding back on is this going to be like clemson florida state where you know we we kept talking about clemson only throwing sideways basically and then um club comes out and fires a bunch of 15 20 yard passes and and they look really good for a while or did they just is is aller just too safe a decision maker not making the the plays downfield that he we thought he would make uh and they just don't score enough so i it's a really like i'm assuming ohio state wins because that's how this usually goes and they still have a five or six point advantage but 
this is Penn State's best chance since what 18 probably uh when when Franklin did his great to elite quote that we still bring up every year because they haven't quite ever uh caught Ohio State yet uh this is their best chance and it'll be really really interesting to see what exactly Drew Aller is capable of I I I don't even know what you're talking about right now with Drew Aller I mean you're 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 making you're making my skin crawl with this we (laughs) we would never we would never tell him to throw the ball downfield. I'd like to know where Rip Engel is right now. What a coaching matchup between a couple of guys who've had some memorable moments in front of the microphone in the first half of the season between Ryan Day and and uh, uh, big game Jimmy Franklin uh, there with the with the big play talk. It, it's pretty amazing. I went back last last night. And we'll leave it on this, and then Duke Dumb loses more than smart wins, which hits close to home. Um, Going through the number of times in recent years that Penn State has either had the lead and couldn't finish against Ohio State in the fourth quarter or got close in the fourth quarter and couldn't get over the hump. They've lost six in a row to them. Under Franklin, they're one and eight against Ohio State. Um, they, you know, they had the they had the lead in the fourth quarter in 2017. In the horseshoe, they had a 12-point lead with eight minutes left in 2018 at home, a loss. They got back to within four in the fourth quarter after falling behind 21 nothing in the horseshoe, 19 loss. Was that Will Levis off the bench? Yes, that was Will yes. Levis off the I bench. I literally remember Googling, like I'd never heard of Will Levis. <laughs> it <was> yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, It would have That's been the right. media guy that was like, who is this guy? And he he <laughs> scooted, though. If I remember that game yeah. right, I was there. He, he got yeah. him in with his legs, yeah. That's right. That's what they were doing. They started running the quarterback more with Will Levis. And then even last year, uh, yep. before Tui Mogulau took the game over, Penn State had a 21-16 lead in the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. And they haven't been able to finish the deal. There's no Sean Clifford to blame it on anymore. So we'll we'll find out <laughs> we'll find out what they're gonna do. It's uh it's gonna be fun. You guys, as we wrap this up, you guys ready for dumb losers more than smart wins? A lot of candidates this week. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the easy, the easy, the easy candidate uh, would have been Colorado, but dumb loses more than smart mm. wins needs to be more than just blowing a lead. That happens in football sometimes. Um, dumb loses more than smart wins could also you could have also had a candidate in Boise State. Boise Ooh. State had a, had a player take a cheap shot that sort of turned the tenor of the game around, but they were still in control. And then you know they gave gave up twenty one points in the last four minutes on another. Hail Mary, the second of the weekend uh, that that won a game because Houston uh, beat West Virginia, also a candidate. Uh, West Virginia dumb loses more than smart wins to let them get into into position to throw the Hail Mary and become the first new Big 12 team to beat an established Big 12 team this season and the only one up to this point. But dumb loses more than smart wins goes to not catching with your hands and catching with your body. Everybody knows that receivers are taught to high point and make the catch, to get the ball away from their body so it doesn't uh, flop around once it hits the body. And I made the catastrophic mistake of body catch with a giant fish flying my way in Seattle. (laughs) And if there was ever a dumb loses more than smart wins moment when you lose potentially depending on my dry cleaner one of my favorite suits when you lose with fish guts on a great shirt that i had there and then when you spend the rest of the day after parading a fish around and then heaving it into the crowd sort of with the faintest scent of seafood all over you I'd say that's a dumb loss you got to wear the gloves you got to catch it away from your body and your pride has to tell you if the fish is scaly and slippery and wiggles through your hands, well, so be it. But protect the suit, the tie, and the pocket square because when you don't, you wind up as the winner of this week's Dumb Loses More Than Smart Wins. It's me. Two I hands like on the gills, Davis. Two <laughs> hands on the gills. I think I, I think my, I did. Uh, the last time we were there, I made the catch with the hands, but the way it was coming at me, I, my ego got so involved that I was like, man, 
you know what? I'm going to body this thing to make sure <laughs> it doesn't hit the ground. And I should have just tried to snag it. And if I missed it, I should sidestep it and not let it get to the suit. That was, you reviewed was the film play. of your throwback of the fish into the stands, which by the way, sources told me somebody funneled the beer through that fish. <laughs> uh, I haven't got a, a second source <laughs> to confirm that yet, but did you feel good watching back on the film that you had good form and you got it into the audience in the way that you wanted? Uh, I, I did. It wasn't like a quintessential, uh, you know, football pass. It was more like one of those Australian rules football <laughs> passes, except I didn't hit it. You know, I sort of <laughs> heaved it underhanded in the uh, Pike Place market fashion as best I could. I felt good uh, watching the overhead cam. I felt pretty good about the distance okay. that it that it got. So at least it got airborne. I'm glad I it didn't clock somebody in the side of the head. I'm just happy you didn't go with Oregon uh, and the fourth down attempts. I, I always love it when the only time people want to talk about analytics is when somebody fails on fourth down. So I was happy to avoid that. Uh, well, that was we, I talk, we talked about it at the beginning, Bill, and I think we were both pretty much on board. And so I'll circle back here. So we'll have one final thing on it because I told Pete, and I think Pete was in, somewhat in agreement with me. I had zero problem philosophically with landing going for any of them, particularly the one at the end of the first half. However, here's the caveat. When the third down play, which was which looked like a touchdown coming out of the snap, and then they have the low ball and yeah. they don't and they don't get it. <laughs> I have honesty compels me to say that's probably when I and it's not because of fourth down philosophy. It's more because of all right, all right. We <laughs> we we sort of blew a chance here. We're getting the ball back. I, I'm going to take the three now. Um but but even that is you know I I will hear the other side of it, but I didn't have a big I didn't have a big problem with it. I I did think Bo was going to pooch pun on fourth and three. Bo, oh yeah, on that one I, I thought that's what he was going to do. Yeah, I I I mean you could almost say it was too much respect to the Washington offense, especially you know because it was just basically hey field goals aren't going to help us here or we don't want to give the ball back because we'll lose um, and. It, that was both factually correct and also not not a great message to send to the team, I guess. But either way, um, yeah, they were all fourth and three. Oregon going, gains seventy percent or gains at least three yards on seventy percent of their snaps. Um, it's a safe a bet I, for whatever reason. I didn't like the play calls or the decisions that Bonix made on those plays. But going for it, I think I, I loved it. I, I I I thought they were it was a very logical thing to do. And uh, you know, w- watching on Twitter or wherever, where it immediately becomes an argument about you know analytics gone too far or whatever. Yeah, Come yeah. on, you you have one of the best offenses in the country. It's three yards. Uh, put it in your best players' hands here. I, I agree. Try to win the game when you have a chance. Uh, I referenced earlier the Colorado Colorado State game. I was critical <laughs> of Jay Norvell for not trying to win the game when you have a chance right then. Yep. Uh, so I I I didn't fault any of that i think it was the sound was down but uh my guy dan rolovsky i think what he was saying on the failed play at the end of the half was that it was a little bit on bow that he has to have some trust and he's yeah. got to fire it to the front pylon he's got to throw it now and he yeah. didn't and when he started trying to create going to one side which i hate two-point <laughs> conversion plays where you cut down half the field unless you get it out fast because if you don't get it out fast, then it just becomes a mosh of people. And they didn't have a throwback guy for him to heave it yeah. on the other side of the field. So probably execution and play call decision. I didn't have a big problem with, but I want to be consistent. <laughs> when when we blow when we blow the third down play, you know, which looked to my <laughs> yeah. eyes like it was going to get you in, that's when maybe I go, I want to go for it with every fiber of my being and I'm going to take the points, you know, <laughs> just to make sure I'm going to mitigate the damage right yep. there, I think is is how it would have looked at. That's interesting stuff. Guys, always great. Enjoy uh, enjoy these Monday uh, lookbacks. Bill, appreciate your uh, flexibility coming in on Monday rather than Wednesday. I'm glad we were able to get a little peek ahead with you on Ohio State and Penn State. Much more coming later this week. That is some kind of showdown. College game day will be there. In Columbus, we'll go inside the stadium for the final hour of the show. Great guest lined up. Really a spectacular uh, story on something that Michigan did in the offseason that will be tested on your friendly game day host, too. That is what's known as a tease. Perhaps we'll talk about it a little bit. We'll certainly preview all the games. Encourage you to subscribe to our podcast. We appreciate you downloading and listening, and we'll talk to you on Wednesday.